Well, Joel, the book of Joel. This morning I want to talk to you about the theme of restoration. And specifically restoration that I believe is the delight of God. Uh, Terry, if you would come here for just, for just a minute. Now, Terry, uh, Terry, I understand, I think, dislocated or possibly dislocated his elbow. And uh, so is, is a little, is a li- a little tender. Sorry, okay, all right. Now, now, I want you to think about the concept of restoration. Because if you look at the word restoration or restore, you'll find it in a number of places in Scripture. Uh, and that word specifically deals with, especially in New Testament days, would have dealt with the concept of mending a fisherman's net. As you well know, uh, most of the disciples were fishermen, and that was a, it was a common uh, means of providing uh, for your family in biblical days was, was fishing. And so when the, when the nets were broken, they couldn't provide a livelihood uh, for their families. And so the nets needed to be mended, or the word really is restored. But there's another word, another concept that goes along with this idea of restoration or being restored. And, and that's one of setting uh, a dislocated or out of place limb. All right. So, so th- that's this is <clears throat> this is how that how that might happen. All right. So let's see. All right. Let's see. All right. So so just easy, easy, easy. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. No! Oh! Oh! Uh, uh, oh. Yeah. See? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. All right. There we go. All right. It's all right. It's good. All right. There we go. That's excellent. All right. Now, now. <clears throat> Did anybody else or anyone else? All right. <laughs> Dr. Anzalone, I just put you out of business. All right. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's the idea of restoration, when something is out of place, needing to be mended because it's dislocated and or even potentially broken. Restoration. With that in mind, I want us to look at the book of Joel. Joel chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1. I want you to hear what the word of the Lord says. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, you old men. Now understand as we walk through chapter 1, the prophet Joel is speaking to a number of people. We're going to point those out. Hear you old men. Uh, These are the old wise men of Israel. Give ear, all you inhabitants of life. Listen, we want everybody to hear what's going to be said. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell it to your children. Tell it to your children's children, he says. He says, listen, I, I want you to tell everyone the events, uh, what's taking place, what's going on. And then he begins to describe the immediate events that are taking place. And the immediate events that are going on in the life of the children of Israel is there is some pestilence in the land. He talks about the, the palmer worm, and he talks about the locust, and he talks about the, the canker worm, and he talks about the caterpillar. And so you've got to understand in respect to a biblical days again, especially you go back to Old Testament days, a farming was the means whereby they survived. And so when pestilence would come along and destroy the crops, literally their lives were ruined. They couldn't survive. They couldn't make it. And that's what he's describing. And then verse 5, he says, listen, I even want you who are drunkards to wake up and listen to what God is saying. For a nation has come upon you. By the way, this nation he's speaking of is a nation of Assyria that we'll talk about a little bit later. And then if you go on down in chapter number 1, verse number 11, Be ashamed, you husbandmen, how, O you vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered. Because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Now, now again, for us, you know, we, we think about that and we say, wow, that's, that's, that's bad news. That, that's too bad that, that this pestilence came along and, and is, is destroying all the crops. And, but for us, quite honestly, none of us that I know of here at Ebenezer Baptist Church 
completely or totally depend uh, our livelihood on farming. So this really, this concept is difficult for us. But let, let's make something really real for us. Let's suppose that tomorrow or the next day or one day this week, uh, you drive to the local grocery store, whether that be Kroger's or Walmart, and you drive there and you, and you go to the door and you open the door and you get your cart and you begin to go down the aisles, but to your astonishment, all the shelves are empty. Now, now all of a sudden, that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Now, what would you do at that particular moment in time? Uh, you, you'd want to know what's going on, what, what's happening, why are the shelves in the stores empty? What are we going to do for food? We've got nothing at home. How are we going to survive? And then you go home, and to your astonishment, as you begin to listen to the, to the nightly news, uh, that's taking place all across the land. There, there is no food supply any longer on any store shelf anywhere in America. Now, now, now you begin to understand what the prophet Joel is saying to the people of Israel. Tough times have come. It's really difficult times. In verse 13, he says, Gird yourselves and lament, you priests, and how you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of God. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to God. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty shall it come. And so when you read Joel chapter number 1, you think, wow, that, that things aren't really, really good for the people of Israel. But God delights in restoration. God absolutely delights in restoring. For a moment, I want you to think about the need for spiritual restoration, especially from a humanity's perspective. From our perspective, when do we need to be spiritually restored? Well, I would say to you, first of all, we need to be restored initially because of our depravity. Now, that, by the way, would be salvation. You see, you and I all, we both came out of the womb totally and completely depraved. Romans chapter 3 makes that very clear. There is none righteous, no, not even one. And as a result of your sin that you're born into, as a result of that, we have this need to be restored back into a right relationship with a holy God. But then there's those midpoint needs of restoration, if you will. Those moments in times, even though we have been restored in respect to salvation, there are those times along in our walk as followers of Jesus Christ when quite honestly we just fail. Can you relate to that? And we are in desperate need of being restored back into, if you will, renewed into a right relationship with the Holy God. And obviously there is our future need for, if you will, a completed restoration that will take place when Jesus Christ returns. I believe in the book of Joel we find some things on which this spiritual restoration is predicated. First of all, I want you to notice that spiritual restoration is predicated on failures. You see, we never have any need for being restored unless we have failed. You'll, you'll never need to be restored unless you fail. And we have all failed at different junctures in our lives. And sometimes our lives are riddled with failures. If we had time, we could go back in respect to the children of Israel, and we could go back and we could recount time after time after time, after time, read the Old Testament. You'll find time, times time, times time, times a hundred times when the children of Israel simply failed to do what God had instructed them to do. Now, now let's ask a very practical question in our life. 
How many times in our lives, or maybe I should ask myself this question, how many times, sometimes in a day's time, do I fail to be obedient to what God asked me to do? And sometimes I go back to that same failure over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I find myself in that place of absolute failure where I'm in absolute need of being restored into a right relationship with a holy God. In the broadest sense of the term, we could go to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You can take every failure that you've ever experienced and plug it back into one of those three root problems of failures. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. And if we're all honest in our lives, we would have to say, yeah, there have been many times in my life where I have failed in either thought or action. Morally, relationally, or mentally, I have failed to do what I know I'm supposed to be doing as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so restoration is always predicated on failures. And we can look around and we can point the fingers at everybody else and point the fingers at ourselves and say, oh, how many times I have failed. But spiritual restoration is also predicated on discipline. And sometimes that discipline is either discipline that has already been enacted by God or it's discipline that is pending. Again, if we would take the time, we could go from Joel chapter 1 all the way through the entire first chapter, all the way down through the second chapter in verse number 11. And there are three types of discipline that we find in the text. There's the immediate discipline of pestilence that's going on with the children of Israel that Joel talked about as we read in Joel chapter 1. There's the pending discipline or judgment that's coming by the Assyrians that God raised up, by the way, to send along to punish and or to discipline, if you will, his own people. Why? Because they had failed. And what's God's desire? God's desire is to bring us back into a right relationship with him. And sometimes he has to get us to the point where he disciplines us. Why? Because whom the Lord loves, what does he do? He disciplines. Why does a loving God discipline us? Because he loves us so much that he wants us walking just as we should be walking with him. And so there are times when he disciplines. There's immediate discipline. Sometimes there's pending discipline for the children of Israel And for the world, by the way, it's mentioned several times in the text, there's a future discipline that's coming, a future judgment that's coming, that Joel refers to it as the day of the Lord. Chapter number 2, verse number 1, Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in the holy mountain. By the way, when you hear that kind of rhetoric in Scripture, when you hear that kind of truth being proclaimed, it's a serious moment. Blow the trumpet. This is a warning sound. The trumpet is being sounded. Sound the alarm in the holy mountain. Why? Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? Because the day of the Lord is coming. There is coming a day that will be unlike any day that has ever been seen on the face of the earth. And that's the day that God is telling to the children of Israel, this day is coming. I'm warning you ahead of time, this day is coming. You see, spiritual restoration is always predicated on our failures, often predicated on discipline, either discipline that has already been enacted or some pending discipline. But spiritual restoration is also predicated on repentance. Look in Joel chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn even to me with all of your heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, and rend your heart and, and not your garments, 
Turn to the Lord your God, for He is gracious. Listen, listen to the words of Scripture. You think, what's, what, is, what is the heart of God? I believe right here, we hear, we see the heart of God. Rend your heart and not your garments. Don't, don't, don't do some external thing. Listen, God's not interested in some external act of repentance. God wants a heart change. He wants a change that's internal. He says, don't, don't rend your garments. Rend your hearts and turn to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful he is slow to anger and of great kindness, and he repenteth him of the evil. Listen, God is a merciful, gracious, loving, generous God, a just God, absolutely. Judgment has already come to the people of God. Judgment is coming in the Assyrian army, and there's a great day of judgment coming. But he is saying, listen, I'm gracious and merciful. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging with you. Just repent. Just come back. I want a restored fellowship with you. I want a renewed walk with you. Repentance. Who knoweth, verse 14, if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord our God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priest and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine inheritance to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? God so desires for His people to walk with Him because He wants the whole world to see who He is. May I remind you of some things in respect to repentance? Repentance begins, first of all, with acknowledgement. That, that means we first and foremost must be willing to acknowledge where we have gone awry. Th those, those places where we have made the wrong turn in our life. Th those places where we have failed to be obedient to what God has asked us to do. That, by the way, uh, maybe some of you have walked through recovery programs. You, you, you know that that's the first step in recovery is acknowledging that you've got a problem. That, by the way, is the first step in repentance. Is acknowledging that you have a problem or an issue. Then I, then I believe also we must not waller in our failures, but rather let's, let's lavish in God's forgiveness. You know, it's a, lot, it's a lot of times it's really easy when we realize that we've failed just to kind of stay there and get stuck. And we just, oh, I failed, I failed, I'm a miserable failure. I, I, I'm worthless, I, I'm, I'm no good, I just fail, fail, fail. I do fail, yes, but wait a minute. I'm not going to waller in the fact that there's been times in my life when I've failed to be obedient to what God has called me to do. Rather, I'm going to turn away from that nonsense and I'm going to embrace the forgiveness of a heavenly Father and I'm going to lavish in the fact that He forgives me. Wow, and He sets me free. There's nothing like being set free when we have failed. But I believe also there must be a, a willingness on our part to enact change and be empowered by the Holy Spirit not to go back that way again. It's so, is it not so easy? I mean, think about it in your own life. Think about the places where you fail the most. Think about it as the book of Hebrews says. Think about that, that thing, that area in your life 
that thing that does so easily trip you up. Think about it. You, you know what it is. I know what it is in my life. You know what it is in your life. Think about it. What we must have is we must have resolve. And by the way, I'm not talking about just, I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking or some just kind of human resolve. No, I'm talking about Holy Spirit inspired, empowered resolve not to go back and return to that thing that I simply keep failing over. Don't do that. But it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit in you that you're going to be able to, to overcome that thing that so easily trips you up. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God did not put us here on earth and he saved us and said, okay, you're on your own. No, he gave us the spirit of the living God to live within us, to empower us to walk as we should. Wow. The power of the Holy Spirit I think all too often in Christianity, we underestimate the power of the Spirit of the living God. Where is He? Where is He, church? He's where? He's in me. Say it. Say He's in me. He gives me all power to overcome my failures and my faults and my shortcomings. Yes, he does. Wow. Then I believe also we must seek encouragement and accountability when it comes to repentance. Listen, it's, it's one thing just to repent and to turn away from, but listen, sometimes we need somebody else to come alongside of us and to be that accountability person or that encourager who's going to help us along the way in life so that we don't get caught up and turn back. Now, do, do you have that encourager in your do you have that spiritual encourager in your life? Or do you have that spiritual accountability person in your life that, that you're really honest with? The one who comes along and says, when you get down and you get discouraged over spiritual matters in your life, they come along and they just you know, whack you on the backside and say, come on, let's go, we can do this. Or, or that, that accountability person who is that person who will look at you with great gentleness and great concern, but they'll look at you and say, don't do that any more, Mark. <laughs> you know I love you, but you ain't going back there anymore. You understand that? And if you do, I'm going to knock your head off. But I love you, brother. All right, let's go. Come on, let's go. We can do it, all right? But that, that's, what, that's, that's what we need. Or what do we do? Otherwise, we're on our own out there wandering around trying to fight this battle all by ourselves. And listen to me, God did not put us here in this world to fight alone. He made us a part of a team. You see, spiritual restoration is always predicated on failure, often on discipline, and certainly on repentance. I've often thought about Peter. You ever thought about Peter? There's a passage in the book of Luke, chapter number 22. Go over to Luke 22. Verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. He says, Peter, 
Satan wants to ruin your reputation. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin your future ministry. So why? Because one, Peter was a leader. Peter had already committed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There's no question about Peter's commitment. And do you notice what, what Jesus says next? But I have prayed for you. What? what? What did I pray for you? That your faith would not fail. And when you are converted, that, that word really means restored. And when you are restored, that you'll do what? That you'll strengthen your brothers. Now, you know what happens after this fact, right? What happens to Peter? Because if you read the rest of the text, you know, Peter, hey, you know, I'm, I'm with you all the way, Jesus. Hmm. Jesus says, well, I've got bad news, Peter. You're going to deny me. And the rest of the story, guess what? Peter finds himself warming his hands by the fire. The little maiden comes out and says, hey, aren't you... Aren't you, one of those, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus Christ? Peter cursed and said, I don't know him. But wait a minute. Then later on, Peter and the rest of the guys, they, they depart and they've gone back to their fishing endeavors. Jesus comes and he meets them. But then you fast forward even a little bit further in Scripture, and you come to the book of Acts. And, and what is Peter doing on the day of Pentecost? Peter is the one who is standing with incredible boldness in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he is the one who is preaching, and he is the one who is leading all of the other leaders. Now stop and think about that for a moment. I want you to stop and think about the moments in your life when you have utterly failed. You know what happens? Two things happen when we fail. Or maybe three. One, we tend to beat ourselves up when we fail. Yes? Two, we've always got some wonderful friends who want to come along and beat us up. Right? Wait, wait a minute. Don't, don't, don't look down your long spiritual nose too far. Because no doubt, all of us in this room have done the same to many other people. We've said, well, I can't believe so and so. Well, he was a preacher. Well, he was a Sunday school teacher. Well, she was this. Well, she was that. So when we fail, we tend to beat ourselves up. We've got others, including ourselves, who look at others and condemn. And then the devil comes along and says, you're worthless, you're washed up, you're no good. Wait a minute. Peter? You talk about an epic failure. Peter had an epic failure. He denied even knowing Jesus Christ. And yet we come to the book of Acts, and here is Peter standing, preaching, and proclaiming boldly, and he's leading, in many respects, leading all of the other disciples. Do you ever suppose that any one of them ever stood back and thought, hmm, I wonder how long this is going to last. I wonder if he'll fail again. My point is this. I don't care how many times you have failed. I don't care how hard you have fallen or failed. You are never, ever beyond the delight of God to restore you. Now look. Look in our text back in the book of Joel. Chapter number 2. In verse number 18. 
And as we conclude, I just want you to see several things that are God's delight in restoring you. Before we do, I want you, I want you to listen. If this morning you are here and you are thinking already to yourself, oh, how I need to be restored back to a walk with God like I used to have. Or, oh, how I need to be restored because this past week I failed in this way. Or, oh, how I need to be restored because there was something, some point in my life that was so disastrous that I, I've not forgiven myself. I know other people haven't forgiven me and the devil is eating my lunch over it. Listen, if you're in any one of those positions, I want you to hear very carefully what the text says to you this morning. Listen carefully. And it would be my desire, the desire not only of this preacher, but I know it's the desire of the heart of God that today you would find restoration. Spiritual restoration. God's delight. Beginning in verse number 18. Look at the text. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. By the way, remember this is predicated on the fact that there's already been failure, there's already been some discipline, and there's been repentance. And as a result of that, it's God's delight to restore his people. You see, I believe first and foremost that God delights in his jealousy and pity over what belongs to him. Do you know that God is a jealous God? He's jealous over you. Why? Because you belong to him. And he pities you. Why? Because you belong to him. He understands and he knows your frame is nothing but dust. And so he has pity upon you because he realizes the frailty of your frame in your humanness. He knows that. And God delights in His jealousy and His pity over what belongs to Him. And if you belong to Him, He has pity on you and He is jealous for you. But verse 19, I believe that God delights in hearing and communicating with His own. Verse 19, yea, the Lord will answer and say to his people. You see, sometimes we get in those places of failure. We, we feel like we have failed so far, so often, and so long that God doesn't even want to hear from us. But listen to me. Listen to me. The God of the universe, the God of all mercy, and grace has his ear bent over from heaven down to right where you are, even in the midst of your failure, and he's just waiting to hear from you because he's desiring to talk with you and to restore you back into a right relationship with him. Oh, God delights. He delights in hearing from and communicating with his very own. The second part of that verse says this, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. You see, I believe that God delights in providing for His own. You see, sometimes this is, this is what we buy into. We think because we've failed, because we've fallen, that God no longer is going to take care of me. Do not believe that lie for one moment. The same God who provided for you at salvation at the cross is the same God who will provide for you every step of the way. He will take care of you or He is not God.
But I believe also that God delights in promoting his own. Look at the end of verse number 19. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. You see, for the children of Israel, all of these other peoples were coming by and they were mocking the children of Israel and they were mocking the God of Israel because of the problems that were going on in the, in the camp of Israel. But God says, listen, if you'll repent, if you'll turn back to me, he says, listen, I, I'll drive the heathen away. There'll be no longer any other opportunity for someone to point the finger at you and say, aha, I'll take care of that. You just leave it to me. Don't you worry about the naysayers. God can handle the naysayers. Verse 20. I believe that God delights in protecting His own. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate. By the way, he's speaking of the Assyrians at this particular time. With his face toward the east sea, with his hinder parts toward the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Listen. When the enemy comes along and tries to defeat you, whether that enemy be human enemy or a spiritual enemy, you can be sure of this. If you have repented and you've turned to God, God will take care of the enemy. He'll drive the enemy far from you. You say, how can you say that? Because I know what Scripture says. Resist the devil and he will do what? Flee from you. But I believe also that God delights in the joy of his own and their abundance. Look at it in verses 21 through 24. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will not cause, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Listen, I'm not talking about, by the way, don't, don't mis misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not talking about uh, some kind of prosperity theology. That's not what I'm talking about at all. But what I am saying is this, that I believe that God delights in the joy of his own people and their absolute abundance, whatever that may be. Because he delights in restoring you back to a place and a position that you once were. Just like that dislocated arm, although it may be painful, it may hurt, but he'll take it and he'll put it back in place and he'll make you good as new. And then verse 25 and 26. Verse 25 for me is a very personal verse. In 1990, I was ordained at a church in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And on the ordination council that I stood before, was an old preacher from the country of Wales called Dr. Ivor Powell. Spoke in a Welsh accent, brilliant theologian. Just to have someone like him even asking me questions was ra rather humbling and awe-inspiring. And so for any of you who have ever been at an ordination an ordination is a time for the candidates to share their testimony, tell the council about themselves, and then answer questions to determine the worthiness of the candidate who is desiring to be ordained into the ministry. So we went through the whole process, and the event was finished, questioning time was done, and we broke for lunch. I was walking down the hallway at the church. 
Dr. Powell came alongside me. I had shared my testimony, how I had made a mess of my life for many years in my life. And he's walking along beside me. I wish I could, wish I could talk in that Welsh accent, but I'm not going to attempt it. He's a little short guy. He's about this tall. You can look him up. He, great, great man of God. He's gone to be with the Lord now. He looked at me and he said, Steve, he said, I want you to remember Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. I said, okay, Dr. Powell, why is that? Ah, he says, let me quote it for you. He says, and I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. For a young man about to embark in the ministry after having made a mess of his life, that spoke volumes to me. And that verse still from time to time rings true in my mind. And I'm reminded it doesn't matter how far away you have wandered. It doesn't matter what failures you have fallen into, you have a God who is an eternal God who is merciful and gracious and He delights in restoring even those years back to you that the locusts have eaten and destroyed. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you, by the way, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Wow. I wonder this morning, it's quite simple, this is the time for you to respond. I wonder for you right now, is there something in your life that needs to be restored? Is there some relationship that needs to be restored? Is there anything at all in your life right now, whether it's between you and someone else or between you and God that needs to be restored? Listen to me. You have a God, if you know Him, and you're willing to repent, you have a God who delights in restoration. And He will make all things new. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411.